Okay, Robot Chicken, what are we doing today? Well, Nick, what we're doing is... <laughs> I don't know if that's a chicken's voice. Well, maybe it is. Yeah, maybe it is. Uh, this is the long overdue video. Um, it, with me slowly creating this course on VS Code and Code for IBMI, a memory jogger for me and to help you newbies out there. <clears throat> in the local code development, which I am loving, by the way. If anyone from the code team are watching this, thank you very much. I'm really, really enjoying playing with this. Um, I've now got to the stage where, as I'm moving all of my source into the source code, I'm separating out bound RPG programs, bound CL programs, from the ILE programs with multiple modules, and of course, service programs with multiple modules, and binding directories, and learning how the binding directories keep those service programs together to share to the RPG and the CL programs. And in my code examples, I use a lot of copybooks, include statements and slash copies in RPG, uh, and how that integrates together with this latest version of VS Code using the Project Explorer function, our application is terrific. So today we're gonna to look at the very, very basics of creating modules, binding them, and seeing how they compile. And next, I'll explain copybooks in more detail, and then I'll record a third video about service programs and binding directories. Those are kind of the three sections that I scratched my head about when I first started playing with this. So I imagine someone else out there is scratching their head about it too. So grab your cup of coffee or pour some fresh tea, the hot stuff, not the cold stuff, and uh, let's dive right in. Okay, so we'll start with uh, launching VS Code from fresh let me close the workspace i've got open all right here i am blank poor lonely vs code oh i've got a little module update look at that in time for this lesson code for IBMI has had a little fix something else has been fixed in there i'm just going to run a restart i basically just always accept any fixes as they hit because that's how I roll. I like to be on the, the bleeding edge of application development. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to start with our regular Explorer. You can clone, if you want to see the source code that I'm working in right now, you can you can clone it from GitHub. Uh, the repository is called nick.litten.public. That's simple. You can see my exact code examples. I can't promise they'll be exactly the same as they are in this uh, video lesson, but they'll be very similar. My code always changes, it's dynamic over time. Always, I learn different techniques, change things, keep you on your toes. But I've already pulled that down to my machine, so I'm gonna open the folder. In your case, you'll just be opening your local folder on your PC where you wanna keep your source files. Um, mine lives in a folder called, unsurprisingly, GitHub, subfolder nick.litten.public. So let's open that one up. Here is my source code in my workspace over on the left-hand side. As we mentioned on in the previous video in this series, here's my Project Explorer. This is the magic that glues my local workspace on my PC. It makes it talk to the IFS location on my IBM I system to allow the compiles to happen. So let's connect that. Just click connect and go to my machine. It defaults in my username and password. And hopefully in a few seconds behind my head, this little box is whirring around. It will uh, connect me. Checking, connecting, blah, 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 doing stuff. A little bit slow. I've got a little tiny, tiny P5 or a P10 out there in the cloud land, but I'm connected. Yahoo! So let's go and look at our open source. What should we talk about first of all? Okay, um, what we're gonna talk about is the include statement, but I'm gonna skim through this because I'll do a detailed video on this in a second. We have an includes folder and it has a CL uh, file in here. And all this CL file is, it has a couple of declare statements in CL. The, um, in, the, in the main CL code, when I open one of these programs, you can see that it's doing an include and it's referencing that source code member. So all this program is saying is, I'm starting receiving a value called message. That declaration for that field is being pulled in by this include. We'll go through that in some detail in the next video. Then what's this program doing? It's changing the value of message and putting in front of it, ILE says, and the value of that message and sending it to the screen. 
Well, that seems pretty obvious, doesn't it? Let's open the bound program. What's that do? Whoa, this one's even simpler. This one just receives a parameter of message, picks up the definition for the size, and just sends it to the screen. So we've got two programs that are doing essentially the same thing here, but they look very different, don't they? They look very different for a reason. Now, the naming standard within um, VS Code for MMI is the first 10 characters of the source file name is what it's going to be compiled as on the machine. And the extension of that source file name tells the compiler what to do with it. When it sees .cLLE, it knows it's going to compile this as a CL module. The fact that I've called this CL module is neither here nor there. I could have called it freshfish.cll. That would have created a fresh fish module up on our machine. Once we've created those modules, of course, we'll then have to have a create program command to bind those modules into the create program. Now, if you prefer like the more old fashioned way of doing it, if you like the legacy way, rather than saying old fashioned, then it's creating a bound program. So rather than creating a module, then creating a program binding the module in, you can just do a create bound program, which does both those steps in one. And you're telling the compiler to do both those steps in one by having an extension of .pugum.cle. This says create a bound CL pugum. If we had .pugum.rpgle, it's saying create a bound rpgle program. Easy pimples. Wait, but the name's different. Yes, because as I started playing with uh, VS Code, I've more and more come to like this Bob the Better Object Builder naming standard. Um, there's several standards built into code for IBMI, but this one makes the most sense to me, and I'm just going to use it. It is. The first 10 characters of your source file name, up to 10 characters, are uppercase. That's the name that it will be compiled with. Dash then says, or the minus sign, says what's coming next is the object description on the machine. So and I always put underscores in my object descriptions rather than spaces. It's just a personal habit. You don't have to. You can put spaces in there if you want. But I called it, so CL bound program is going to be create an object called CL bound program. It's going to be a bound CLLE program, and it's going to have a description of simple underscore bound underscore CL underscore program against the object. CL module with no text will be created just, and it'll be called CL module on the machine. So where's the uh, ILE program creation bit? It's hidden quite neatly in the rules file in this folder. The rules file tells the compiler what to do with the source code that it finds in this folder, remember? So it says, okay, create a, a program called CL bound program and create that from the source file called clbambugum dash simple dot blah, 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 blah. That reference exactly that first one, right? Then it says create a CL module called CL module from the source called CL module. Then create a CL ILE program from the CL module. So maybe this isn't the most uh, clear way of naming because I've got CL modules and CL modules. Um, I could call it, for example, let me just type this in so it makes more sense to you. I don't know if it will, but how about I change the name of the module that it compiles? It will go to the source called CL module and create a module on IBM I called CL ILE Pugum dot module. Then that module will be bound into an actual ILE program. Make more sense? I don't know, is that more confusing? Yeah, I'm going back to how it was. <laughs> hey, welcome to real-time video recording and me blathering away while my brain tries to figure things out. So this is how I'm going to tell rules to do it. Create the bound program from there. Create a module called CL module. Then use that module to bind it into an ILE program called CL ILE program. That's how I like it. That's how it's staying. So let's close these source members down. We know exactly what to expect. The CL bound program is just going to stick the message to the job log and the CL ILE program will stick that message to the job log, but it will suffix, prefix, prefix it with ILE says. So we know which one's doing which. 
Remember from our first video, I'm just gonna keep clarifying this all the time. The rules in the, in the folder where your source code are tells the compiler what to do with the source code. Because these rules are using code that is definitely including things from the includes folder, the rules in the root of our entire workspace, these tell what directories are gonna be used. So if your include statement is failing, it's because you haven't got includes in the root, okay? All you have to have in here is includes, which is the name of the includes. Let's say you called that folder copybooks. You would have copybooks put in here, right? And obviously you need to have your folder names where your code lives. We're looking at sample CL code now. You could call it QCL source. I'm a stickler for the old standards where you, never, you should never create anything you create with a Q in front of it because Q means IBM created this. It's the original standard. So it grinds my gears when I see programmers doing it. Plus, QRPG source, and it's just a NAF standard. Call it something sexy, that's what I say. <clears throat> all right, we're gonna deploy all of this up to the IFS. It will go to our deploy place, which we've defined in our project. So we have like the, uh, on the source, we have the deploy location. I'm deploying to home, Nick Litton builds public. That's my folder. Home, Nick Litton builds public. That's where this local stuff is gonna be deployed to. I'm gonna completely delete all of that because I just don't care. This IFS location that we're deploying to is transient. It's not like a permanent store for you. Your permanent store is local on your machine and that is kept in Git. That's your, that's your system of truth, system of record. So you can delete this IFS location, but when we run our compiles and Bob the Builder deploys to that location and then compiles from there, it's useful to go and look in that IFS location to see what it's doing, I find anyway. Um, let me launch up a good old fashioned green screen. Well, white screen in my case. If I have a look at uh, my library, let me make sure that I delete anything beginning with CL in my library Ooh, without typing in NAF commands. Imagine that library is completely empty. Well, you're not imagining, it is completely empty. Okay, so we've got our source code and we wanna compile it. How do we do that? Well, we've got two ways of doing it. We can right click on the source member itself and say, run compile. Or my preferred technique is just to, um, in the project explorer, do a right click the project explorer run and do a run build. Or when I'm working, I just press the shortcuts, control shift B and it runs that build. Because what this will do is it will look at my whole project on mass that I'm working with. It will compare it to what it's put into the deploy location. And if something's got a different date timestamp, then it sends up. So in this case, we've changed these three different um, modules, the bound program, uh, the module source, and the ILE statement were all different. It's figured that out, and you can see that it's done three succeed, three total. So our little compile should have created three programs, and it has. And it's done exactly what I asked it to do, right? The bound program has the text on it that it pulled up from the source. You notice that I put those underscores in because it looks neat, and it takes them out on the actual bound object, which also looks neat. CL module is created with no description against it because I didn't define one. Um, and then ILE program is created with no description because I didn't define one. So should we call them and see what they do? Yes, Nick. Okay, so let's call a CL bound program and we'll just send in hello as our text, right? I'm expecting it just to send hello back to the job log, which it does. And I call CL ILE program with hello. It sends back, ILE says, hello. Remember those two source things we looked at? So those two programs are doing exactly what we wanted them to do. Uh, the includes are working. Hurrah! Okay, let's look at RPG. RPG works exactly the same way, apart from it's written in the much sexier RPG code. The glorious RPG code. Okay, here's, ignore these first three lines, crud. This is a change, read, update, delete, subfile example I'm working on for a different lesson. We're gonna look at these three examples here, exactly how we did them for the CL. You can see that I've got one called .pugum.rpgle. Remember, this will create as a bound RPG program. I've got one called hello world using copybook. This is .rpgle, so this will compile as a module and then need to have the create 
um, program, ILE program defined. And then another example, I'm doing some crazy stuff with the code to just to show some of people doing the RPG basic class, some other things you can do within Hello World. That's also a .RPG LE, so that will also need a separate ILE um, create command. So I'm expecting to see in my rules file three modules being created and two uh, ILE programs being created. Let's have a look. Yes, that's exactly what we see. So we see hello world dot pugum being created from the source code with the source member on it. We see the two modules being created from the source code with the source member. And we see hello advanced dot pugum and hello ink dot pugum being created ILE programs from those modules. So at the moment, this is going to create one RPG bound program, two modules and two ILE programs. So let's run it and see, shall we? I'll just press good old shift, control shift B to deploy the lot. Off it runs. Oh, I haven't changed any of this code on the machines. I'm not even too sure it will do anything. Okay, so because I haven't made any changes to it, it says I've got nothing to do. It knows that the last time I deployed it, it compiled and changed those. That's why it's nice doing the control shift B. So let me go to hello world. I'm going to delete all of them so you can see them being recompiled. If we flick back into VS Code and just do Control Shift B again, that's the right click build down there on Project Explorer. Here it is launching into action. Hopefully now it recognizes, yep, because oh, there's a module, I'm gonna create it. There's another module, I'm gonna create that. Oh, there's a bound program, I'll create that. Oh, there's an ILE program, I'll create it. Another ILE program and I'll create it. It's done exactly what we hoped for. So if I look up my library in Greenstein, refresh it, Here's my three examples. So let's do it. Let's call hello world, shall we? Very boring. It just says hello world to the screen. That's our really simple bound program. Let's call the uh, hello ink. I honestly can't remember what this does. Oh, it does the exact same thing, but it's using lots of copy books to suck, suck it in. Oh, and then it forces me to answer. It won't end until I press yes to continue. Um, I don't know if Hello Advance will even work at this stage. I started typing it. I don't think I finished it. Hello World. Oh, it's doing some other stuff. Oh, I think it loops around. It forces you to put a yes, and it's going to grow and have some other bits and pieces in there. But there you have it, creating modules and ILE programs the easy way. I'm sure there's a lot more to, to come with this excellent implementation of code for IBMI within Visual Studio. That's it. I hope that made some sense. I hope I didn't waffle too much. And I hope it's helped someone out there on your journey to migrate source from source files to the IFS to your local PC and then up to Git. So I suppose at this stage, the last thing I should sign off with is click on my Git. And it's been recording all of these changes I've been making to these hello programs while we've been playing with them. Uh, hello updates. So I'm going to tell the nick.litten.public repository that I'm going to send some small hello updates. It now just takes all of those code changes, syncs them up to GitHub so that the stuff on GitHub has these latest code samples that we've just gone through in the video. You can now go and suck that code down to your machine and play with it to your heart's delight. Right, I hope that helped someone. Um, and I'll see you next time. All right, bye.